to Season 2 of Sunday School Theater. Our regular service will resume in a few minutes, but first we have a delightful story acted and narrated by our very own Sunday School team. Without further ado, let's sit back and relax and enjoy a wonderful story. Good morning, kids. My name is Earl Perkins, and I'm a professional storyteller. Would you like to hear a story this morning? Here we go. Hey, Earl. How's it going? What you doing? Well, I was about to start sharing a story. <laughs> Today's story comes from the Bible, in the book of Mark, chapter 5. Oh, good! I love stories! Is this a Christmas story? No. Our story begins on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee? Is this a fishing story? I love fish! Is it a beach story? I love going to the beach. No. It's a Jesus story. You mean God's son? The one who turned water into wine? The one, the one who made the wind and the waves be still? The one who fed 5,000 people with a single kid's lunch? Yes. I love Jesus. This is going to be a great story. Um, when are you going to start telling it? As soon as you are ready. <laughs> ready? Set? Go! A large group of people had gathered around Jesus to hear him speak. I bet they'd heard about his amazing power. Near the sea, there was a town, and in the town there was a synagogue. Uh, what a gog? A synagogue. It's like a church. One of the workers at the synagogue was a man named Jairus. Hmm. Jairus, Jairus, Bophirus, Bophina, Bophimus, Bimus, Jairus! What are you doing? Um, I'm playing the name game. You take the first letter from. <clears throat> Sorry, one of the workers from the synagogue was named Jairus. Jairus had a daughter. She was very, very sick. So he couldn't go hear Jesus speak? Actually, he did go to Jesus. When Jairus saw Jesus, he fell at Jesus' feet. <laughs> he fell? How embarrassing! He didn't trip and fall. He fell down on his knees as a sign of respect. Jairus knew all about Jesus, and he believed in Jesus' power. Oh, well, that's different. What happened next? Jairus said, my little girl is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so she'll get better and live. So Jesus went with him. Well, what about all the people who had come to hear Jesus speak? Many of them went with them. Did they run? I bet Jesus was in a hurry. No, Jesus wasn't in a hurry at all. As a matter of fact, he stopped and talked along the way. While he was speaking, some people came from Jairus' house. Uh-oh. He told Jairus he should stop bothering Jesus because his daughter had died. Oh, no. See, I told you they should have run. Wait, there's more to this story. Jesus ignored what those men said. He looked at Jairus and said, don't be afraid. Just believe. And then they ran all the way home. No. Jairus kept on believing, and they kept on walking. When they got to his house, there were people crying all over the place. Jairus, Jesus, and his disciples, Peter, James, and John, went inside. Jesus asked the people why they were crying. He told them the girl wasn't dead. She was just sleeping. They all laughed at him. How rude! Well, the people didn't quite understand Jesus' power over everything. Did they tell him to leave? Actually, Jesus told them to leave. Then he took the little girl's parents, 
and his three disciples to where the child was. Jesus held the girl's hand and said, Talitha Kum. Talitha Kum? Was that her name? Talitha Lita Bobita Banana no, Bobita. No, Talitha Kum means little girl. I say to you, get up. Get up? But she was dead. Not anymore. Jesus had used his power to heal her. She stood up and walked around. Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Wow, she must have been better if she could eat again. When I'm sick, ugh, I don't eat anything in case I throw up. She was better. Jesus had used his power to heal her. Everyone was totally amazed. I bet that story was on the front page of the Galilee Daily News. Actually, Jesus told them not to tell anyone what had happened. Why? Didn't Jesus want to get rich and famous? No. Jesus had a different reason for coming to the earth. But that's another story for another day. Oh, I can't wait to hear that story. But thank you for sharing this one today. You're very welcome. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, Thank you for giving us this story today about Jairus' little daughter. We know that you have power over death. Help us to remember that you have the power to do wonderful things for us too. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. And welcome to our worship service this Sunday morning. Uh, special welcome to Pastor Vicki Koch from uh, Waterloo CRC. Glad to have you out here to teach us this morning. I invite you to stand and sing with us as we raise our praises to God this morning. Welcome. 
presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away.
this God stoops to receive now the love of our hearts and calls us to remember the depth of his love for us in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Oh God, we joyously come together to worship, realizing we need not summon you into our midst, for you are here. We need not call you into the secret places of our hearts, for you are there. We need our eyes of faith to be opened that we may see you, our ears to be unstopped that we may hear you, our minds to be sensitive that we may know you, and our hearts to be tender that we may receive you. Grant each one of us a blessing, O Lord, as each one has need. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit among us. The king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are
night is holding on to me. God is holding on. When the night is holding on to me, God is holding Well, at this time, all the kids can go down to Sunday school, so find your, your teacher who will be holding up the sign, and have a wonderful time. This morning, our scripture reading will be from Mark 12, verses 28 to 34. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning and we're thankful that we can be here to worship you. Um, we thank you, God, for the reading, for your word, Jesus. And I pray, God, that we, you may be here, that your Holy Spirit may flow within us as we hear what you have to say to us through this message, Lord, and through these words. We pray these things in your son's name, amen. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well, said the teacher, the man replied, you are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. Fellow disciples of Jesus Christ, I wonder what question you or I would ask Jesus if we ran into him today in the temple courtyard. This one, asked by the scribe, seems a little bit odd to me, given that scribes were experts in the law and he really should have known the answer. Now, there's no indication in Mark that this scribe was trying to trick Jesus, he seems to be asking an honest question. This scribe seems to be here to show Mark's readers that not all the scribes and Pharisees were bad. He represents the good ones. And yet, it's strange that he asks Jesus this question with what seems to be an obvious answer. I mean, I would ask something more like, why do some people believe and some don't? Or, where did evil come from anyway? But this scribe asks, which commandment is the greatest? Which commandment is first of all? Now he asks in part because he has been listening to some Pharisees and Sadducees and Herodians ask Jesus questions that were meant to trick him and make him look foolish. Questions about divorce and eternal life and about seating arrangements in the kingdom of heaven and about taxes and about resurrection and about where Jesus gets his authority from. This scribe is 
is impressed by the way Jesus has handled himself under interrogation. And so he comes forward and asks a question that the religious leaders themselves often debate. There are, after all, 613 laws in the Old Testament. There are 365 negative, thou shalt not. There are 248 positives, thou shalt. And so lots of attempts were made to distinguish between the great commandments and, and the little commandments because the rabbis were aware that sometimes keeping one commandment means breaking another. That's why they were always looking for principles to help them decide which to keep and which they could break. In our tradition, the, the classic example of this is, you know, would you lie and break the ninth commandment if you were hiding Jews in your basement during World War II? So the scribe asks Jesus, which one? Which one is the greatest? And Jesus answers by combining a verse from Deuteronomy with a verse from Leviticus. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. That's the greatest. And the second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, you might notice that this is a neat summary of, of each of what we often call the two tables of the law. The first four commandments of the ten being commandments about how to love God, and, and the next six being commandments about how to love our neighbor. So it seems really simple, but it's not really, is it? Now, in the Gospel of Luke, this particular exchange leads the religious leaders to ask, well, who is my neighbor? Who do I have to love? And that leads to the parable of the Good Samaritan, because, you know, the Jews in those days had a very narrow definition of neighbor. But in Mark, the discussion goes in a very different direction. Jesus takes this opportunity to critique everything about the temple system. And he implies that all of the religious rituals that they take so seriously had lost their intent and purpose. And that was a powerful criticism, especially since this conversation was taking place at the temple. And it was taking place in the middle of Passover week. It was just a few days before Jesus was going to die. This, this is when and this is where Jesus says love. Love is more important than any religious act. And okay, that seems obvious. Although, we have rituals too, don't we? Rituals that sometimes may seem more important than love. All the things that, that we do because we believe they are expected of good Christians, but things that can be done without love. Going to church on Sunday. Taking communion. Sending our kids to Christian school, even things like, like volunteering in the community or sponsoring refugees. These are good things, good things that Christians do. And, and given how much good Christians and the church do in the world, and we do a lot of good, why? Why is it that the church doesn't have a better reputation for love. When many of our friends and co-workers and neighbors think of Christians, they don't always think of Jesus or love or kindness. All too often, many of them think of people who are judgmental, opinionated, hypocritical. Like Gandhi was famous for saying, I like your Christ, it's Christians I have a problem with. Shane Claiborne put it well, over the years, Christianity has lost its fascination because it looks less and less 
like Jesus. And it's true. Over the years, many Christians have hidden their lights under bushels by favoring judgment over grace, hate over love, rules over relationships, dogma over forgiveness, and despair over hope. Why? Why is that? Maybe that would be a good question to ask Jesus. Why is it so hard for so many to put this commandment to love in the front of everything else? One answer, I think, is that loving our neighbor means loving our actual neighbor. Not just some faceless sea of humanity. It means loving the people we know and interact with. Now, this could be wife or husband, children, friends, colleagues, but it could also be the person who personifies everything that we despise. The very opposite of what our tribe believes and stands for. And and of course, even some of our fellow believers can be difficult to love. Don't you sometimes find yourself like Lucy and Charlie Brown when she says, I love humanity, it's people I can't stand. Sadly, for many, it's even harder to love oneself than it is to love God or to love neighbor. And that is particularly sad because it's pretty hard to love God or neighbor when... We do not love ourselves. Jesus says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. I read this week that all churches include three different audiences. The bewildered, the bleeding, and the binarounds. And none of those love themselves very much. The bewildered recognize basic religious words like resurrection and salvation, but only vaguely. They're not exactly sure what those words mean or what they need. The bleeding just got bad news. The cancer has returned. The spouse is leaving. The bean arounds have been coming to church for years, but... I have a feeling that Garrison Keillor is talking about them when he says that just standing in a garage does not make a person a car. There has to be something more. Now, in addition, on any given Sunday, there is an 80-year-old woman who is still wondering if the resurrection is just a story. There is a young man who can't stay in rehab, who is sitting behind a pillar and contemplating how his friends and family might be better off without him to worry about. Churches are filled with people who have difficulty for all kinds of reasons with loving and being loved. Loved by God, loved by each other. It sounds so simple, but it is not. It is not easy to love or be loved. It's hard to say what's more difficult, actually loving God, loving neighbor, or loving ourselves. And so it's easier, really, to just go through the rituals and not think about it too much. Now, at least the scribe in this story realizes that that is not the answer. That is what he has been doing. He knows he's missing something. And I suppose that's why Jesus tells him that he is not far from the kingdom. Because he does have the right answer. He's so close. You know, I've usually read this to sound negative, emphasizing that, yeah, yeah, you're not there yet. But recently, I've started to see it as a positive. Like, like when my Aquafit instructor calls out, you're almost there, keep it up, you're so close, you can do it. It seems to me that Jesus is encouraging the scribe, encouraging him to keep thinking and to keep wrestling, to keep using his mind, which incidentally is something that Jesus added in his answer. 
The Old Testament that he quoted only says to love God with heart, soul, and strength. Jesus added mind. We and the scribe, we need to think. But we and the scribe also need to realize that even though having the right answers will get us close, we need to actually do the loving. To love, to worship, to love God and neighbor. We, we can't have one without the other, not in truly meaningful ways. So let's think for a minute about what loving a God and neighbor and self might actually look like. The message, paraphrase, says that we are to love God with passion, prayer, intelligence, and energy. I, I like that. Passion, prayer, intelligence, and energy. Those are good synonyms for heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, I suppose we could tease these four things apart, and I tried hard to do that, but in the end, I think we need to keep them all together to get the whole idea. The command is to love God with everything, everything we have, and not just a touchy-feely kind of love, but an active love that puts God above everything else, a love that includes worship and, and obedience and service. And since Jesus added mind, and the message calls that intelligence, a love that includes thinking and asking questions, a love that resists the anti-intellectualism that we see in some branches of the church today. Now, we love God with our souls when, when we sing songs to God in the sanctuary and, and when we thank God for his blessings every day. We love God with our minds when we study the world God created and when we study the word of God. We love God with our strength when we build habitat houses or when we give a lonely person a hug. Then how do we love our neighbor? Strangely enough, by keeping the commandments. The same way we show love to God, that's how we love our neighbor by keeping God's law. In the first century, as the story goes, once a Gentile came to a wise rabbi and said, convert me on the condition that you teach me the whole Torah while I stand on one foot. <laughs> the rabbi converted him, saying, that which is despicable to you, don't do that to your neighbor. That's the whole Torah. The rest is commentary. Go learn it. And here's another idea from a pastor I know. What if loving our neighbor is more about learning to receive and to be helped by our neighbor instead of always being the one who does the helping and the giving and has all the answers? Next to Jesus, I think Bob Dylan says it best, may you always do for others and let others do for you. Because in that moment of humility and receiving and acknowledging our needs, we just might find ourselves not far from the kingdom of God. Because God's love is tied to loving and receiving love from neighbor. Once there were two neighbors who farmed together. They shared equally in all of the work and they split the profits exactly. Each had his own granary. One of the neighbors was married and had a large family and the other was single. One day, the single neighbor said to himself, it is not fair that we divide the grain evenly. My neighbor has many mouths to feed while I have but one. I know what I'll do. I will take a sack of grain from my granary each evening and put it into my neighbor's granary. So each night when it was dark, he carefully carried a sack of grain and put it in his neighbor's barn. 
Now, the married neighbor thought to himself, it is not fair that we divide the grain equally. I have many children to care for me in my old age, and my neighbor has none. I know what I'll do. I'll take a sack of grain from my granary each evening and put it in my neighbor's granary. And that's what he did. Each morning, the two neighbors were amazed and confused to discover that though they had removed a sack of grain the night before, they had just as many in the morning. One night, they met each other halfway between their barns, each carrying a sack of grain. They understood the mystery. They embraced with joy. And as God looked down from heaven, he saw two neighbors embracing and said, I declare this to be a holy place, for I have witnessed extraordinary love here. And legend has it that God chose that spot for Solomon's temple, where God's love and neighbor love met. But now let's not forget that Jesus says to love our neighbor as we love ourselves which implies that we are supposed to love ourselves, whether we are bewildered, bleeding, or being around. God's command is the same. Love me with your whole heart and, and love your neighbor as your self. For some, that is the hardest commandment of all. For some, it seems impossible possible. Others of you feel okay about yourselves, but love? Many of us in the Christian Reformed Church grew up hearing ourselves described as a worm. We learned in catechism that even our best works are as filthy rags. And each one of us knows the darkness in our own hearts. And we're supposed to love ourselves? Yes. <laughs> the good news of the gospel is that God so loved the world, that God so loved you, that he gave his son so that you can have abundant life. Here in Mark 12, Jesus is about to show the people just how much God loves you. He is about to give himself up for you. And if God loves you that much, you may love yourself. Because you are a child of God, cherished by God, of great value to God, loved by God, by a God who is love. It is no coincidence that God desires from us just what he gives to us. And, and, and then loved by God, we can love our neighbors and we can love ourselves because self-love begins by drawing deeply in this truth that we are loved by God. And... That, ultimately, is the only reason any of us can be close to the kingdom, because God wants us, because God loves us. You know, when people ask me what it means to be a reformed Christian, I always say something like, like that, right? It means we confess and we believe and we trust that God loves us, that God loved us first. We don't earn God's love. We don't need to, and we can't. All of the Christian life is joyful response to the love of God. For centuries, Jews have begun the day reciting the Shema, which is the line with which Jesus begins his answer to the scribe. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Our God. That's why we love him. That's why we love our neighbor. That's why we love ourselves, because the Lord is our God. The one God is our God. We are his. And he loved 
us first. Amen. Please stand and uh, join us in responding to that in love and singing this song. feeling well this morning, uh, but she's prepared a prayer adapted uh, by Larry Dornbos from the Calvin Institute of uh, Christian Worship. And so won't you bow with me now in a time of congregational prayer while we say this prayer. God who stills the waters and quiets the storm. God who lets not a hair of our heads fail without your knowledge. God who brings sight to the blind and words to quieted tongues. God who created the earth and all that is in it. God who teaches the foolish and strengthens the wise. God who promises a coming day when there will be no more mourning or crying or pain. When death will pass away. When all things will be made new. Bring healing to our world, to our neighbors and to us. Bring wisdom so we may honor you and bring glory to you in these days. Bring strength so we may rejoice in your love. Bring patience that is grounded and actively living in your ways. Bring hope that is rooted in your good news of shalom. Bring grace and calm to us so we may bring grace and calm to others. Jesus, shepherd your sheep. Have compassion on us as you did so long ago. Teach us to know wisdom and to live with prudence. To live as the sheep on your right hand, not as the goats on your left. To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. To use our gifts for the common good. To hear truth and discern lies. To seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. To live with gladness because the Lord reigns. Today in your house, our hearts join together to share our burdens. Our voices join in praise. Together we hear the amazing echoes of your word proclaimed. And from here, we are sent on mission into every sphere of human endeavor. We lament our lack of love of worship in the past. We lament for sisters and brothers who are sick. We lament a broken and sinful world. We cry out to you, Redeemer of all things, for our leaders who bear a deep burden for your people. 
for our leaders who are struggling and striving to build community in this time of pandemic, for grace and healing and hope, first for those deeply struggling and then for us all, for you to reconcile all things to yourself through the blood of Jesus Christ, for the day to come soon when we can have our hopes fulfilled and join together with the whole community of Christ. We pray with thanksgiving and praise for the amazing news of Kevin's cancer remission. Our words are inadequate for the gratitude we have for this healing. Praise you, Lord. We thank you for others in our church family who are experiencing your healing touch. Young Sill, Marlon, Tommy, and others. Lord, we thank you. And we also pray for these, but others going through health journeys as well, physical, emotional, and spiritual. And our hearts and prayers go out to those in, our, in the journey of grief. We pray for Jim and Carolyn with the sudden passing of his sister Yvonne this week. And also for Oscar and Joanne, Sid and Hilda. Lord, may your presence and peace be near them as they navigate through the reality of life with the loss of their loved one. Be their comforter and provider in these days. We don't always understand the hows and whys of this life, but Lord, we trust you and know that you are a loving and good father who has a loving and good plan for us, your children. Remind us to call on you as your provider, our counselor, our savior, our all in all. Lord, thank you for what you have done and what you are presently doing and what you will do. Lord, at this time, we also want to pray for Acton Food Share. We pray that you will bless the tithing and the giving this week that in part goes towards this ministry. We pray that you will look after those in need of food and clothing and shelter. We pray that you will look after our community and our neighbors in every way, O oh Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. rise to receive God's parting blessing as we prayer as we prepare to leave this place enter the mission field the world that God's love that God loves may the Lord go before you to guide you behind you to protect you beneath you to support you beside you to befriend you the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you. Be not afraid. Go in peace. Amen. These are the days of Elijah. trials of famine and darkness and sore so we are the voice in the desert crying prepare your way of the Lord behold he comes riding on the clouds shining like the sun at the trumpet call lift your voice let's hear of jubilee and out of signs hill
There's no God like Jehovah. 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 He holds me out, riding on clouds, shining like the sun. Trumpet call.